Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. Today, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about where my focus will be in the remaining weeks of the session. I first ran for governor because I saw an opportunity to bring more balance to Montpelier and make real progress for our state at a sustainable pace and at a price Vermonters could afford. And that's what I've been focused on ever since. With that in mind, this is how we build our budgets, as well as the policy proposals we bring to the legislature. We not only think about the outcome we want to achieve, but the steps needed to get us there. Oftentimes in this building, it's easy to ignore the practical side of implementing ideas, which ends up taking longer and costing more. I also believe, and still do, that Vermont isn't affordable for families and businesses. Vermonters continue to make that abundantly clear. It's what I hear when I go to events and what people are calling and writing to our office about on a daily basis. I see and hear stories of people living on fixed incomes who've been here their entire lives, have given back to their communities, have family here and want to stay, but don't believe they can afford to do so anymore. I hear the stories of moms wondering how they're going to be able to afford summer camp for their kids. They say it was going to be hard enough with inflation and other increased costs, but now they see all the tax increases that the legislature is considering, and are left wondering what more they can do without to provide for this memorable experience for their kids. They are the ones I have in mind when I evaluate bills and make decisions about what to do with them. That's why when it comes to the yield bill being considered today in the House and the huge property tax increase it will bring, I don't believe it's something most Vermonters can accept. And from what I've heard, I don't think the Senate will either. Vermonters simply cannot afford a historic double-digit increase in their property taxes or a substantial hike in their rents, which will also be impacted because landlords have no choice but to pass those increases on to renters. They're making that clear at the polls, and I hope they're making it clear to their representatives in Montpelier. This is especially true after a 20% hike in DMV fees, a new payroll tax coming July 1, inflation, and the hike into home heating costs we know is coming as a result of the clean heat standard they passed and I vetoed last year and they overrode. Vermonters are clear, they've had enough. As the yield bill moves out of the House into the Senate, I'm hoping the Senate will work with us to prevent this enormous tax increase from happening this year and making sure we're not in the same exact situation next year and in the years to come. I'll now ask Commissioner Bolio to come up and talk about the real impacts the yield bill will have for Vermont households and businesses. Greg? Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon, everybody. As the governor mentioned, I'm here to speak today to some of the impacts of the projected 15% average bill uh, increase for homestead property taxpayers and the 18% average property tax bill increase for non-homestead taxpayers that would come to pass as part of the new yield bill being considered in the House. For clarity, homestead properties are all, <clears throat> excuse me, all owner-occupied properties, and non-homestead are all properties that are not declared as a homestead. Non-homestead properties are not simply second homes. That category includes commercial and business properties, rental properties including long-term rentals, farms, and more. So let's look at a few examples of how these increases will uh, impact Vermonters uh, if they come to pass. The values that you'll be hearing here are listed values on the grand list, and uh, the increases that I'm speaking to are only the increases to the education property tax. Folks may experience uh, additional increases if their municipal taxes go up as well. So for a property in Ripton with a listed value of $250,000 and a homeowner with a household income of $40,000, that owner would expect to pay 34% more in property taxes in fiscal year 25, or $244. A mobile homeowner in Craftsbury 
with a value of $60,000 and the same $40,000 household income would expect to pay an additional 30%, or $239. In Brattleboro, a homeowner with a listed value of $140,000 and $80,000 of, of household income would pay an additional 15% in property taxes, or $333. And in Norwich, an owner with a listed value of $500,000 and a household income of $135,000 should expect to pay almost an additional $1,500, or 15%. And lastly, for the homeowner examples, a homeowner in Plymouth with a listed value of $300,000 and a household income of $140,000 would expect to pay $2,148 more next year, or an increase of 36%. Each of these cases present affordability challenge, particularly for Vermonters on a fixed income and in the lower income brackets. I would also note that each of the examples is factoring in the 15% property tax credit increase that's contemplated in the yield bill today. I would also note that the 15% property tax credit increase does not simply decrease average property tax bills overall in the state it shifts costs to other property taxpayers. So a 15% increase in the property tax credit for homestead properties to keep that average bill at 15% pushes the non-homestead average bill up to 18%. So a four unit apartment complex with a commercial property on the ground floor in Montpelier with a million dollar listed value would expect to pay an extra $2,162. A $6 million uh, large uh, commercial apartment complex in Winooski would pay nearly $23,000 more. It's hard to imagine those kind of costs not getting passed on to tenants. As you've heard directly from the governor, more needs to be done to address both the long-term structural problems in the education fund and the immediate affordability challenges that Vermonters are projected to face. Uh, I worry that if this year doesn't spark real change, I'm not sure what will. And with that, I'll hand it back to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now open up to questions. Recently, the Commissioner, you guys talked about maybe deferring payments for this first year to kind of try to ease something. But now, I guess, have those conversations expanded all? I know Treasurer Pichek kind of had his thoughts about it. Where do we stand with that proposal at the moment? Well, we're waiting for a willing partner in this. I think it's still viable. Um, my concern is, and, and Craig can talk about this as well, but my concern is that if we do nothing, uh, the education fund is out of balance. The rating agencies have warned us about this for a long time. The affordability of the state of Vermont is always a question that they have, and they bring it to our attention. Um, this is going to exacerbate the situation. So doing nothing might reduce our bond rating as well. So I would say if we have to make a calculated um, decision on this, that we ought to help out Vermonters and couple that with some long-term savings and even short-term savings. Uh, cost containment is something that they'd like to see. Uh, because again, over the number of years that I've been into these uh, bond rating uh, calls and agency and going to visit them, um, their concern is the broad perspective. How is Vermont doing? And they brought up before that we're paying down uh, some of these uh, property tax rates with surpluses. And what are you going to do when the surpluses uh, run out and, and run dry? So again, doing nothing I don't think is an option. And I would rather do something, find some cost containment for uh, an expanded period of time, and uh, let's get control of this. Governor, a lot of the fixed. Oh, okay. Do you want to add? I'm, I'm happy to add in a few. I, I just would say, I mean, I think the governor explained it very well, and I think it, the, the context of that idea, I think, is really important, right? So, the yield bill had originally dropped on a Tuesday, right, and had a couple of key things in there, right? It had short-term cost containment and allowable growth rates, and also had. Uh, for fiscal year 27, a significant uh, change to the education funding formula, which uh, I think the administration, I, I believe members of the Ways and Means Committee also believed would have natural cost containment uh, elements to it. And so when uh, we submitted testimony by Thursday, the, the, reform, the reform to the funding formula had been changed to a study, right? And we went in to testify on Friday. And both in the testimony document and in committee mentioned that 
in order for the deferment idea to be successful, uh, it had to be paired with the short-term cost containment to make sure you didn't have a future property tax spike, and also the, the additional reforms that needed to be necessary both for the funding formula and for districts to actually be able to address those cost pressures in future years. So uh, certainly, I think the administration agrees that the deferral plan in isolation is not what we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at a multifaceted approach that puts us on a multi-year path to sustainability. And that's one out of the box idea that might help uh, reduce the, the spike and the cliff that folks are gonna be facing this year if nothing's done. Commissioner, a lot of the solutions that we've heard this year have been sort of education policy focused and consolidation or tax on budgets, that type of thing. But have you heard, or is there any room in the discussion this year for the CLA, Common Level of Appraisal? I mean, I'm hearing that's a really big concern for um, for property taxpayers that hasn't necessarily been talked about a lot this year. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question, actually, because I think the, the CLA, so the Common Level of Appraisal, I think has been um, maligned, scapegoated this year as the driver behind tax rates going up, uh, and that is not correct. Uh, the, the common level of appraisal is a mechanism to ensure that every town is sending its fair share into the education fund, right? And it's based on a study that the department does that compares listed values in a town to sale values in a town. And there's a lot of controls to make sure that, that sales are arm's length and a lot of work that goes in to make sure the accuracy of that, that study is uh, robust. Um, when the CLA drops, when property values appreciate, which is what Vermont has been seeing, that impacts the yield, right? And so that increases the yield because we have a larger property tax base uh, uh, to be able to, to assess against. So I think in these cases, what's, what's happening is um, districts are enjoying that uh, higher than it would otherwise have been yield when the CLA decreases but then not necessarily always, and I'm not saying every district is doing this, but not necessarily always factoring in the change to their individual CLA that they could expect based on what those changes are. And, and frankly, to be fair to folks, one of the biggest problems with the education funding formula is complexity, right? So I don't think it's obvious that uh, those CLA impacts get baked into the yield necessarily for everybody to understand that. But in this case, it's not the CLA itself that's driving tax increases, right? If you had uh, CLA changes, drastic CLA changes, where everything else in the education fund was held equal, actual bills would not change, right? Because your, your rates would be adjusted by the CLA. Um, but if you don't have additional spending pressures, you're not actually going to see a change in your actual bill that you get. Governor, if the Senate doesn't go along with these, if the, if the Senate, you know, as we know, passed the third reading today in the House, if the Senate doesn't deliver these changes, could we expect a veto on, on the, the yield bill? Um, we'll see. Um, again, I, I look forward to, um, to engaging with the, the Senate on this issue. I think uh, the pro tem has made it known that he isn't intending to leave here without some relief. Um, so we'll see what happens uh, from there. So we want to, again, want to engage the Senate, see if there's something we can do to work together uh, to provide relief for Vermonters. Also, speaking of the Senate, slightly different from property taxes, so tax related in general, their version of the budget's on the Senate floor uh, this afternoon. I was just wondering whether it's kind of the OPR fee change compared to the spending packages of the House, but if you just had any time to look at their budget and kind of just what you think about it. Yeah, I don't know what's included. Um, Here's my concern is that it spends much more uh, than we had introduced, um, mainly in the waterfall, um, which is spending up any uh, additional resources uh, that are coming our way. So when you couple that all together, it's um, you know not a few million, it's tens of millions of dollars uh, spending more than we had contemplated. And you couple that with the Budget Adjustment Act, where, where they spent $15 million more to begin with. So right out of the gate, we're out of balance, uh, so to speak. So I'm still concerned about the tax increases that they're going to have to put into place uh, to, um, to prop this up. And it's something that, um, again, I don't think Vermonters should uh, and, and expect uh, to be burdened with. Commissioner Bolio will be talking on Common Sense Radio tomorrow about uh, 
the, the promo said uh, 500 million of new taxes, I think was the expression. Uh, is there a list of all of the, the new taxes that, that we're looking at, like a, a laundry list of them? Um, yeah, you mean between the House and the Senate? And, right. uh, I, yes, I'm sure, yes, there is. I mean, we keep track. Obviously, as best we can. It's hard to keep up some days, but yeah. uh, we're doing the best we can. I, I'm sure we'd all be very interested in that. Um, any positive progress on housing legislation since we met last week? I know that the the Senate, um, particularly the, the chair of the Senate Economic De Development Committee, is working with the chair of the Senate Natural Resources Committee to come up with uh, a proposal, S311, how much of that will be included in the uh, in the grand bargain at the end of the day. So uh, we're waiting as well to see. We've made um, suggestions and we'll see where they go from here. Right? The, the main um, proposal from our perspective is just to include S311 in its entirety. That would be the easiest thing to do. Governor, also kind of going off of this Act 215, uh, maybe Secretary Moore can chime in too, but there's a bill that's in the House right now, the, the omnibus sort of flood safety bill, you know, aimed at, I think, big takeaway is giving the state more oversight of how we use and develop in our, our river corridors. I mean, I mean on the sense of, of, number one, what the bill does, but sort of how, how you feel about it. Um, again, if she's willing to get up and come over here. <laughs> I assume you're talking about S213? Yes, that's what Okay, so it, it has several different components to it, but I assume the piece you're particularly speaking to is changes regarding how we regulate flood hazard areas as well as river corridor areas. Um, this is a, an important and really significant piece of legislation. Um, it would implicate over 200,000 acres of land area based on our best estimates and some 45,000 parcels. Um, certainly the, the best way to minimize future flood impacts is to avoid conflicts um, and preventing new construction in uh, challenging places is, is an important component of that. There's some precursor steps before we jump right into river corridor regulation that we see is equally important, including infill mapping, recognizing there are lots of places where we've already built uh, in floodplains and river corridors, and we're going to have to manage for that, regardless of whether or not we let infill development occur. Um, that's an important component to it. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a sort of a devil in the details piece as that bill comes out and making sure that we've got the right order of operations and frankly the resources necessary to support this work. Um, I wouldn't say a, a final judgment's been made, but we've talked about um, trying to avoid future conflicts in our river corridor areas. That said, the bill also includes some other, what I would say are lower priority um, pieces of work, including uh, some codifying existing agency practices around wetlands mitigation, uh, looking at dock foam encapsulation, and I think that's also a challenge to this bill as it includes things that could be potentially very important and then some lower priority activities mixed in, but that also come with a very real price tag. How, how would uh, you know, the, the river corridor piece sort of interact with Act 250 discussions? As you know, we're, we might be setting up this new framework of these tier jurisdictions, exemptions and, and more development in our downtowns, but as we know, many of our downtowns are in floodplains and in these, these river, in, in valleys, right? So how do you see those two interacting with each other at all? Correct, Th those are some of the questions we've asked as H687, which is the Act 250 bill, has moved through the House and is now in the Senate. Um, it includes tier three jurisdiction, which is supposed to be areas that, critical resource areas that receive a higher degree of protection. Named explicitly in that is river corridors, and yet it's not particularly clear how that matches up with our designated downtown areas and then the desire to have that critical resource designation. So it, it's an area of, I think, that's still a little gray. Really, Governor, today the Senate Education Committee is expected to vote on your pick, Secretary Saunders, from the hearing yesterday. Just wondering if you listened to the hearing at all yesterday, if you had any thoughts on it. 
Yeah, I did listen to uh, some parts of it, and uh, I thought she did a great job. Uh, I want to give credit where credit's due. The chair did a, a masterful job of keeping everyone um, civil, and uh, and I think that it was it was what a hearing should look like, um, just asking questions and allowing uh, the uh, the candidate to to at least uh, answer the questions. So, but I thought um, Zoe did a wonderful job. I'm very proud of uh, her testimony, and I think it laid out why she is the person that we need in this position. Um, she's, she's open uh, to suggestions, wanting to work together in a collaborative way, and, uh, and I, I believe that came through. City Council's Governor Montpelier is slated to re-vote on its budget imminently, and the, the recrafted budget would include the closure of the Roxbury Village. School, uh, how are you feeling about the fact that some of these rewritten budgets might lead to the closure of some small rural schools? Yeah, no, it's very difficult. I think I talked about this um, some months ago um, when we were talking about, I, I remember Shap Smith saying this, uh, everyone wants to save money. Uh, everyone thinks we ought to, or many people think we ought to be uh, closing some of the small schools. Uh, they just don't want it to be theirs. And I think this is the case here. And I don't know any of the uh, intricacies here, um, but, um, but this is something they've made a decision on. And obviously, this is a tough pill to swallow. But with the reduction in the number of students that is continuing uh, and the costs increasing, we have to make some adjustments somewhere. So uh, I'm not saying that this is the one we should be closing. I just I don't know all the details, um, but I know these tough decisions have to be made. So 15 school districts who have voted twice on school budgets, 13 have said no both times. Representative Carolyn Brannigan calls this a tax revolt, an old-fashioned tax revolt. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I don't think we've seen anything like this uh, for quite some time. And uh, and I think, again, uh, you know, the initial $200 million increase in, uh, in property taxes and the education fund, it was uh, uh, too big a pill to swallow. So uh, yeah, I think people uh, can relate to uh, an increase in their, in their property taxes when they're just scraping to get by now. And I don't, I, as I said in my remarks, some are just wondering, where's it gonna come from? What am I going to do without? Where am I going to get this extra money? I'm working two jobs now. Am I going to have to take on a third? I just don't have the time. I want to spend time with my family. So it's the affordability of Vermont uh, that is in question. It's something that I've been talking about for the last eight years. And, uh, and it's, again, this was foreseeable in some respects, this, uh, this cliff uh, that, we, that we met. We knew it back in December, and um, it hasn't fixed itself. So I, I think taxpayers are just are voicing their displeasure in the, uh, in the voting booth. Um, are we looking at double-digit increases in following years, too? Um, are you folks projecting that out at all? That's, that's the concern. Like, if you don't fix the structural problems that we have in our education system, then we're bound to continue to see this continue. Um, so again, I, I even the legislature understands that. They're, they're, proposing to study this over the next two years, but if we don't do anything now, immediately. We're gonna see another increase next year, and the year after, and the year after that. Got a few folks on the phone. We'll start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, the, um, the state opened up the first uh, um, federally funded EV charger yesterday. What are the plans going forward with that? Do you know off the top of your head? Well, I think I have Secretary Flynn right here in, in the office, so uh, we'll let him. He was at the, at the ribbon cutting yesterday. So this is, um, this is a, a great step. Um, fast charging is part of the answer, and we need more of it in, in more areas uh, throughout Vermont if we, want, if we want this to be viable. Thank you, Governor. Uh, yes, yesterday I was in Bradford along with Secretary Moore, Secretary Curley, um, Shailen Batt, the Administrator of the Federal Highway Administration, the Vermont Division Director Randy Warden, and several people, Congresswoman Ballant, 
And we did open the first site. This is a uh, supercharger site, if you will. There are four 180 volt, kilovolt, excuse me, four 180 kilovolt uh, connections, and they can all run simultaneously. I'm told that they can charge a vehicle in about 15 minutes. And through the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Funding, or NEVI, we have plans for a total of 15 of these across the state of Vermont. We expect to have the next 14 sites uh, for construction under contract within this year. So what that means is they may not all be built within this year, but they will all be under contract for construction in this year. Um, and these are primarily looking at more rural corridors. They're also looking at corridors along interstate routes and less so perhaps in the more urban areas where it's much easier to currently find uh, level three charging. But these are phenomenal machines, great partnership with Norwich Technologies, Green Mountain Power, uh, Drive Electric, uh, and obviously ACCD and, and uh, ANR. So um, again, first of 15 altogether, and they can charge 180 kilovolts simultaneously. Great project. Thank you. Joe, do you have um, uh, sites located yet for the, these? I don't know if we have all 14 of the other sites located at this time, Tim, but I can, uh, we can follow up with you if, if we do. I don't know that we do at this point. I have, I have an uh, ulterior motor here. I have an uh, EV, and uh, right. you know, going down 89 or 91 can be a real challenge, and that's um, you know, obviously where most of the, that sort of long haul traffic is. Right. I might add, too, that um, just last week we put out a request for information from electrical contractors that are interested in this work. And that closes on May uh, 22nd. And after that, we will engage on contracting for those next 14 locations. The, the governor had previously, not to take up too much time, the governor had previously said that uh, locating the rest stop could be problematic uh, because of the separate federal funding on, on those. Is that, is that off the board at the, you know, the rest stops? At this time it is, correct. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. Tom Davis, Columbus, Vermont. Thanks, Jason. No questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Thanks, Jason. No questions today. All right, Keith. Three in a row. Yeah, also, no questions. Uh, hat trick. <laughs> Back to the room. Governor, um, kind of going off the EVs, I understand that the, the Senate is uh, moving forward with um, uh, registration fees for, for EVs in part to try to make up for some of the lost gas tax that we've seen over the past few years. What, what do you make of this, this new fee? Well, again, it's something that we've been uh, contemplating for a while, uh, the rub. Uh, amongst many uh, in throughout uh, the traveling community is that uh, uh, EVs aren't really paying their fair share because of a user fee that the bridges still need to be repaired uh, that we still need paving culverts need to be replaced and somebody has to pay for it so um, I think it's moving in the right direction I know um, I know it's again difficult some who have uh, EVs have voiced their concerns they don't want to have any deterrent to buying them um, but but we need, we need the funding uh, in order to continue uh, to make sure that we maintain the roads. And also speaking with the Senate this week, um, Senator Bobby Starr announced that he won't be seeking re-election. I think this makes at least three people, including Senator Mazza, Senator McCormick, that, that won't be returning to the Senate. As you know, these three are a little bit more fiscally moderate or more philosophically in line with you, maybe? Uh, I, two, I out, two out of the three, maybe, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, you, what, what is this, this, I know we had a big turnover a couple of years ago, but what, what are you seeing and what does this mean for the Senate? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's difficult uh, to experience in some respects. It's the end of an era. I uh, have a lot of respect for the Bobby Stars of the world, certainly Dick Mazza and Dick McCormick as well. I served, uh, when I first came into the Senate, I was uh, on the Natural Resources Committee and uh, Dick McCormick was the chair at that point in time. And uh, he, was, he was very good at, uh, 
at ha listening to all sides of uh, different viewpoints. And uh, I was expecting far worse, and uh, he proved me wrong. Uh, so I've always remembered that, uh, it, again, even those he disagreed with, he would make sure that they had a seat at the table and they were able to voice their concerns. Now, that, that didn't mean he would vote in favor of whatever they were um, um, promoting, um, but at least he had, uh, had the ability to, to listen. Uh, so we're going to certainly miss uh, many of them, uh, and, um, but it's part of our demographics here in the state. Uh, you know, we see it every day uh, in every entity that we're getting older and uh, we need more youth in the state and we need more people engaged, so we'll see what happens. As you know, the Senate is maybe fair to say a little more of a moderate chamber when it comes to spending and fiscal issues. I mean, how, how does that weigh on you when you think about, you know, spending priorities and the state budget and, you know, if there's fewer, you, were, yeah, you know, I guess, what, how, how do you feel about that? Obviously, I'm, I'm concerned, um, and I've said this before as well, the legislators, um, who have some longevity, who've been here a while, have experienced uh, some of the downturns in the economy. And, uh, and so that makes them maybe a little more cautious about spending and overspending in particular. Um, so um, some of the younger members have never seen it or heard it, never been through any sort of depression or recession. And so, um, so that's, that's the problem, the experience uh, that they have in uh, some of these fiscal uh, times, uh, difficult times, uh, I think has been, uh, has been helpful. So, um, so the more we lose, but we're, I believe we're about to experience more. I mean, we started, we are getting a taste of it this year. It just, it's not, uh, it's not sustainable. The road, the road we're on, the path we're on, especially with what the, what the, uh, the House has passed uh, this year, as um, it's not a sustainable path. We can't afford it. How are you feeling about your re-election plans, yay, nay, just, I know you Nice know. try, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll get through the, the legislative process and then I'll make an announcement. Uh, Governor, uh, what, what country was the international traveler who had measles from and was he or she here for the eclipse? Um, well, we have, um, Patsy Kelso on, Dr. Kelso, um, maybe she can give us some information or not on that issue. Thank you, Governor. Um, the international traveler was not here during the eclipse. Um, we're not getting information specifically about where they were from, um, just because it's not necessary to protect public health. There's no reason for the public to know that, but I will say they were not here for the club. I think people are sort of curious why, why they're here. I mean, I am. Well, there's one. Um, <laughs> sure. I, I, you know, people visit Vermont all the time mm -hmm. uh, from different countries. We actually encourage them to do so. so I don't think this is uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, so the out of the ordinary part is someone who has been infected with measles. So that's, um, that's the concern. But, but I think the, um, our, our agency of human services uh, is handling this appropriately. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll get through this. Is the state monitoring at all the, the nationwide issue with bird flu and cattle? Have there been any detected cases in the state? We are, we are always monitoring uh, that. Uh, maybe Secretary Tebbets could weigh in on that. I, I read it in the weekly reports every week um, about what we're seeing across the country and, and uh, we're, we're making sure that it doesn't hit here in Vermont. Hanson? Yes, uh, thank you, Governor. My apologies for my camera attack day up, but uh, uh, yeah, we're continuing. We have we're having um, you know daily calls right now on a cadence about this. Um, as you know, um, it's been poultry. Uh, now it's been transferred over to the, the dairy industry. Um, a couple of headlines out of that: um, milk is safe. 
Um, pasteurization uh, is the key. Uh, absolutely no problem with the milk supply. Vermont has not had any animals that have been infected at all. Um, uh, most of the states, uh, you know, Texas, Kansas are the early ones. Um, you know, they're looking at uh, USDA, um, they're looking at some movement of cattle uh, as well. So that some states are restricting movement of cattle. Um, you know, we're always taking a look at that depending on, you know, how it's, uh, if it's spreading or not. So it's something we're monitoring very closely. Um, but at this point, um, no animals in Vermont are impacted. But none of our neighboring states as well. It's, it's more centered right now and um, sort of in the, in the south and the Midwest. Thank you, Anson. I know I've been greedy, but I have one more question. Uh, corrections is often considered the redheaded stepchild of the Agency of Human Services. Governor, when was the last time that, that you visited a state prison? Uh, it has been. Um, it's been at least three years since I have. Do you see any? But I, but I, but I would also say it's been a while since I've gone to one of the district offices in VTrans as well. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize them as the uh, stepchild that has been forgotten. Uh, we are constantly in contact with them, and they're an essential part of uh, our administration. And how's the slated to vote on third reading of the ghost guns? Do you bill requiring serialization of unserialized guns. They also added in there a prohibition on deadly weapons in polling places. Would it take effect immediately in time for this election? What, what are you making of that so far? Which part, the, the ghost gun no, in the, particular? The, the, the. Um, you, you know, I think the House uh, with the ghost guns has uh, made some positive changes to that bill, so um, I'm encouraged. Uh, there's one a piece of that that uh, still bothers me uh, a bit, and that's uh, and that's possession uh, with a with a ghost gun that it has to be serialized. Um, and I believe that we should just allow people who want to have a, a ghost gun or, or build their own ghost gun. Um, it, I, I'm just I know it's just a civil penalty, but how are we going to enforce that? Are we going to actively pursue them? And, uh, and I, I don't think it's going to solve any problems. Um, transfer of ownership is another deal, and, uh, and I believe that uh, they should have a serial number attached if you're going to uh, transfer ownership. So that's where I think, from my standpoint, um, would like to see them go further and take that provision out. What about the section that would increase penalties if you commit, uh, I think it's a violent offense, <laughs> possession of a unserialized Yeah, I, I think that's, that's fine, right? Thank you all.